Welcome back to the channel. I know it's been a little while. When I first started this channel, I had already finished playing the Banner Spear and was almost done playing the Meteor. So I had plenty of content to get through before I ran into a roadblock. Well, that changed a little bit with my latest class. I already had this channel going strong when I started the drill, so I needed to take a little time. Make sure I learned the ins and outs. I didn't want to give you a guide too soon. Well, now that I'm level 6, I feel like I know enough, and it's time to get to it. So let's get going with the Frosthaven Drill Class Guide. Okay, first things first. We will be spoiling the heck out of this lock class. Please remember that. If you don't want to know anything, if you don't want to talk about the puzzle book at all, which we will talk about in just a second, Please turn this off and come back a later time or whatever. If you're cool with all that, if you're cool with spoilers, let's get going. Now here's the first big spoiler. This class unlocks via the puzzle book. It does also require you to get to a certain point in the campaign, but it ultimately unlocks through solving a puzzle. Now is that a good thing or a bad thing? I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to be completely upfront with you. I do not like the puzzle book the way it is implemented in Frosthaven. There, it's out. I said it. I don't like it. I also know I'm not alone in that. And here's what I want to talk about. I'm not going to get too far into this. We'll have a different video some other time where we get into it deeper. The main thing that bothers me is I don't like that the puzzle book is actually locking content behind it. I wouldn't mind the complexity of the puzzles or whether they are frustrating or not. If it just opened smaller stuff that was side stuff, maybe if it just opened like story beats or something like that, or, you know, throwbacks to Gloomhaven, other things of that nature, I would be fine with it. I do not like that you have to finish certain puzzle to unlock certain classes like the drill or the metal mosaic as it's actually called. That doesn't sit right with me. I also don't like that you have to use the puzzle book to actually progress to the end of the story in Frosthaven. Isaac and the team at Cephalofair, if you are listening, please do not do that with your follow-up. I understand that you really like puzzles. I do like the puzzles too. I enjoy solving some of them. Some of them are pretty clever. Some of them are downright frustrating, but I do like solving them. I just don't want to have stuff locked behind it that's important to the overall Frosthaven experience. It should only unlock side stuff. If you want to get into it, there are some rewards that you'll enjoy but not that you have to do it to get through the campaign or to unlock things like classes, which are everything in Frosthaven. Here's a look at the front of the character card for the drill or metal mosaic. A couple of quick things here. One is that you do have tank hit points. You start at 10. You gain two every level up to a maximum of 26 at level nine. The nine card hand limit is on the small side, but you have some neat tricks up your sleeve, which you'll use to manipulate the cards that you have available to you. We'll talk more about those as we get to them. The most important thing to discuss here, though, is the main mechanic of the drill, which is pressure. You have a little gauge right here on your character card. You start every scenario in the green portion of the gauge. As you perform abilities with the drill, they may cause you to raise or lower your pressure. Now, when this happens is always after that action completes. So you might have a bottom action that causes your pressure to raise up, but that happens after that bottom action is complete. The same goes for a top action in that case. Now, how does pressure actually affect the way you play? Well, many of your cards have different effects depending on what pressure level you are at. As it says here on the card, you will have bonuses and penalties associated with whatever pressure level you are at when performing certain actions. And one important note about this is that you have to perform all the bonuses or penalties for whatever pressure level you are at when you perform that ability. The other thing that I want to note, which is very important, is that although some abilities will cause your pressure to go down, that doesn't mean you then also get to use another line of the bonuses. The only things that are not mandatory in those lines are element consumptions. The way that this works is very similar to the Blink Blade. The Blink Blade, you had fast and slow states, and you had to determine at the beginning of every turn if you're going fast or slow, there's time tokens, we don't need to get into how it all worked. The important thing is that the ability cards were slightly different depending on whether the Blink Blade was going fast are going slow. Similarly, when you're playing the drill, if you are at red pressure, you'll have a different effect for certain abilities than if you are at yellow pressure or 
green, or even blue. Now just like with the Blink Blade, it's very important to manage your time tokens and your ability to go fast or slow. The same has to be said for the drill. You have to be able to manage your pressure appropriately. The drill is not a class that you can just play turn to turn, forgetting about what you did before or not planning for the future. You really have to think about this turn, the turn following it, and maybe the turn after that to get the most out of this class. If that sounds fun to you, then you're in the right place. Let's flip over that character card and take a quick look at the back. It looks like complexity of four, I think that's fairly accurate. Like I mentioned just before, there's a lot of planning you want to do to get the most out of this class. You can't just go turn to turn with it. It does generate ice and fire, though I would say that I don't see the usage of elements to be very important to this character. I do generate them sometimes, and I occasionally use them, but I'm more often letting other people in the party use them as they're more important to their particular classes. And taking a quick look at the chart down at the bottom, you'll see that it's very heavy in melee and very heavy in defense, and that is definitely true. You do have one or two little things you can kind of do at range, but very generally you're going to be getting up close and personal with enemies to do damage with this class. The drill also has a lot of ways to defend and retaliate and cool things like that. The drill also lists mobility as kind of high. You do have quite a few good movement abilities available to you, especially at different pressure levels, which we'll see in a little bit. Before we get to the individual cards, let's talk a little bit about builds with the drill. Basically, you can be a tank, or you can be a tanky DPS. You have a lot of hit points like we already talked about, so you can either do a whole lot of damage, or you can soak up a whole lot of damage. The choice is yours. However, I want to note one thing here that I think is very cool about this particular class. The way that the pressure mechanic works, it can kind of allow you to vacillate between those two builds a little bit within the context of your particular cards. It's not like you can just suddenly turn into a tank for the entire scenario, but there are ways that you can suddenly turn into a tank for a round or two and soak up more damage or retaliate or do other cool things like that. We'll talk about that more as we get into the individual cards. So without further ado, let's get into those. Here's a look at our first card, Steam Armor. In this case, the top action gives you one shield and generates ice. There are two different pressure lines on this top action of this card. If you're at yellow pressure level, you'll gain two shields instead of just one. You'll also gain an experience, and you'll have to move your pressure down one, back into the green. If you're at the red pressure, however, you'll get an additional two shields for three shields total for the round. You'll also gain an experience, but you will also have to take a damage. And lastly, you'll have to move your pressure down, which will bring you all the way back down to green from red. I actually used the top of this card just the other night when I was at the red pressure level. We were playing scenario 137 and there were a whole bunch of robotic bolt shooters and ancient artillery and I wanted to soak up a whole bunch of shots in one round and soak them up I did and that three shields helped quite a bit. One important note here, you'll see that there are no lines for green pressure or blue pressure on that top. They won't always have different lines for all the different pressure levels. If you are a different pressure level than the ones represented, you just get the base of abilities of that card. As far as the bottom action, you'll have to excuse me a little bit. I have already enhanced a bunch of cards in this class. I didn't feel like messing with the stickers and forgetting what was where. So you're going to get the enhancement here. So the unenhanced version of this card, the bottom action is a move to and it generates fire. If you're at the green pressure level, when you perform that move to, you also move your pressure up one. If you're all the way down at blue when you perform this move to, you still only move your pressure up one, but you also gain an experience from it. And here's where I'll note that you can generate quite a bit of experience with this particular class if you're carefully managing your pressure and taking advantage of these things as much as possible. The next card here is Ancient Drill. Apologies again, this one is also enhanced. Ignore that poison that's on there. What is actually there is just an enhancement diamond. In this case, the Ancient Drill is a three damage, one pierce melee attack. If you're at green or blue pressure, that's all it is. If you're at yellow pressure, however, it's an attack four, you get an additional two pierce, so pierce three, gain an experience, and you have to move your pressure down one. If you're all the way in the red, you're getting an attack five, pierce four, with an experience, you take a damage, and you have to move your pressure down one. Now, you have to see that a lot of these cards are pretty complicated, and you have to pay attention to everything that's in them. So keep that in mind as we keep going forward. 
And I will tell you that this is one of the bread and butter attacks that I use again and again and again. One of the things that the drill is really good at is dealing with those pesky shielded enemies. Now let's look at the bottom. The bottom is a move three. And then if you're adjacent to an obstacle, you may destroy that obstacle to raise your pressure up one. Next up, we have Rocket Boots. It's an attack three with push two, also generates fire. It does also have an enhancement slot up here that I've not yet used, interestingly. The bottom here, though, I have used the enhancement slot, so please ignore that plus one. At its base, this card is a move three with jump, but it gets significantly better depending on what pressure level you're at. If you're at yellow pressure, it's a move four with jump, which is pretty good, pretty solid, but a lot of classes have a move four with jump. However, if you're in the red, it turns into a move six with jump, and not everybody can do that. To move six with jump, you get an experience, you also have to take a damage again, and you have to move your pressure down one. I think you'll notice that in a lot of cases, the red pressure level has a lot of benefits, but also usually has drawbacks in you taking damage directly. And this is suffer damage stuff, so there's nothing you can do to stop it. If you perform this ability, you're going to take some damage. But hey, who doesn't want to do a move six with jump all the way across the map occasionally, right? This is a fun card that I will always take with me just for that bottom action. Power Core gives us our first burn card. The top action of this card at its base is an attack four with stun and generates an experience point. As we mentioned earlier, you do only have a nine card hand with the drill, so I do not recommend using this card at its base. But let's take a look at what happens at different pressure levels. At yellow pressure levels, it turns us into an attack five with wound and stun. It generates an experience and moves your pressure down one. And that's pretty good, but I still think I wouldn't use it in most cases. However, in the red, that is the time that I would consider using this in the right situation. That does not give you any more damage. It's still an attack four, but you get to add an extra target. So you get to do an attack four with stun and wound on two different targets. It generates an experience, you take a damage, and you have to move your pressure down one. And you also get that additional experience from the card itself. So I would suggest not using this card unless you're at yellow or red pressure, at the very least. And I'd shoot for that red pressure. I also think this is a very good burn card because of that bottom action. It gives you a very useful bottom action. It gives you a self heal. And you will need it with all the damage you can take with this class. At its core, it's a heal 3 that also raises your pressure one level. If you're at green pressure, it turns into heal 4. But if you're all the way down in blue, it turns into a heal 5 and you gain an experience. Even though I don't use that top very often, it being a burn at all, this is a very useful card to have and I use it quite often. Steel Piston is our next card. It's an attack three and you get to play it into your active area. And then later on in the scenario, you can basically spend this card to add plus two attack and an experience to another attack. To do that, you do have to pressure down one, so keep that in mind. The bottom is a base move two, but you're, if you're at yellow pressure, you get to move two and attack two. Gain an experience and move your pressure down one. If you're at the red, however, you get to move two and attack three, Gain that experience, take a damage, and move your pressure down two. I do like that you have a move and attack that you can use at level one with this class, and there are situations where this could be very useful. However, and this is important about cards like this, remember that you do have to pressure down after you perform those move and attacks. So don't think you can move, do an attack, and then do a red pressure level top attack. You will not be at red pressure level anymore. You have to move the pressure down after you resolve that card's action. Now we're at pressure buildup, and this is our first card with any kind of element consumption on it. I've mentioned that I usually leave element consumption for the other people in my party. They usually have more effective uses for it. The uses for it on this card are okay, they're decent, and I will use them if they are available, but I'll usually give preference to my other party members. So, the top action here. It's an attack 2, but if there's ice available, you can consume that ice to make it an attack 4 and gain an experience. You do also pressure up with this card. The initiative here is 20, which is a pretty good one, especially early on. And the bottom at its core is just a move three. But if you have fire available, you can consume that fire to also bring your pressure up one when you perform that movement. And the other thing you'll notice on here is that if you're at the blue pressure level, you also get to add a shield and an experience for this particular movement. Here we are at my favorite card, which I use all the time. I love this card, Beam Axe. It's an attack forward, it's base for its top action. 
But if you're in the yellow, you get to do, do that attack four on two enemies in that formation that it shows. You gain an experience, you take a damage, and you have to move your pressure down one. However, if you're at the red pressure level, you can get up to three enemies in that particular formation. Again, look at the card, look what formation you have to be in, and you'll know that that's not a difficult formation to accomplish. In that case, you also get an experience, you also have to take a damage, but then you have to pressure down two levels after you perform that attack. I'm always looking for opportunities to take advantage of this card. This is a great card to use if you have other cards that can increase the power of your attack, other cards, other potions, whatnot. Now is the time to use them if you can get the most out of this one. The bottom is also a base move four, which is just a good card to have around period. It's always nice to have a move four available for when you need it. This move four can be even better though. If you're at the red pressure level, you get to move four and then all adjacent enemies to you at the end of that movement suffer one damage. You gain an experience and you move your pressure down one. And this is an interesting card where the other effect is if you're all the way down at the bottom or the blue pressure level. If you're in the blue, it's a move four and then you get to perform a heal one targeting all allies within range one. So if you can get a group of your allies together, do a move four and heal all of them for one. Then you gain an experience, and in this case, you get to move your pressure up one if you're in the blue. I like the bottom action on this card, but I'll be totally honest with you, I'm usually saving it for that top action. <laughs> there are times where I want to use that bottom one, but it's much less often than when I want to use that top action. Nothing more fun than getting an attack four on three enemies. Went from my favorite card, B-Max, to a card that I've never used in Memory Drive. I mentioned very early on in this video that there are ways to recover cards. But the ways you can recover cards, I think, are not very good, and this is the, an example of that. So for Memory Drive at its base, you play this card as the top action, you get to recover one card. So that math just doesn't make sense to me. I'm spending a top action in order to get a different card back. I guess there are situations where I could see it, like I play this and then I get to get BMAX back into my hand. Maybe, yeah but it just seems like an odd trade-off. I feel like I've wasted that action. Now, it can be better if you're in the green and there's ice available, you can burn that ice in order to recover two cards instead of just one. If you're at the blue level, you also get to recover two cards, but then you gain an experience and you move your pressure up one. So yes, there are situations where that can be useful, but I just feel like there's better ways to stop, to spend my top action. And the times where this will work I just, I don't know. I'm wanting to deal damage. I don't want to spend a turn where I'm not doing anything. I could really see using this if like you've cleared all the monsters in a room and you're moving on to the next room. Then maybe this makes sense. But I just never see that happening. So I've actually never brought this card with me. But maybe I'm wrong. Show me in the comments if I am. It's also a 64 initiative, which isn't helping you in any way. The bottom is a move two. Then for every pair of cards in your discard pile, you get to increase that move by one. You have a nine card hand. The most possible pairs you can have is three pairs in your discard pile. So that would make this a move five. And I mean, a move five is good, but it's not, doesn't even have jump. So it's not, I don't know. Again, doesn't seem worth it. And maybe there's once a scenario where you actually get a move five out of this bottom. It, again, it just seems like the top and the bottom of this card, they just don't make sense to me. So I just didn't really bring it. Here we have Super Heat Transfer. Really like this name. And if you look at the card, you see all the different pressure up symbols all over this card. You'll realize that it is appropriate for what the card actually does. So if you really think about this card, the top action is a really piddly attack one, basically. Maybe you get to add wound. And the bottom is really just like a move two. And in many cases, when you're using it, it's actually a move one. So this card is not about the actions themselves. It's about how they can affect your pressure levels. So let's get back to that top, first of all. It's an attack one. If you can burn fire, it's an attack one with wound. Attack one with wound is at least somewhat useful. But attack one, you know, not so much. But again, it's about the heat transfer, right? If you're in the green and you perform that attack, you get to move your pressure up one. If you're in the blue and you perform that attack, you get to move your pressure up one and gain an experience. And the card itself, the top action, gives another pressure up one. So if you're in the green or the blue and you use this piddly little attack, you will move your pressure up two. And as you'll see later, this card could really help if you're moving towards one of your particular masteries. Again, we'll cover that later. 
The bottom is just a piddly move two at its base. If you're at the yellow, it's a move one and you move your pressure up one. But keep in mind, since you're at the yellow, this is a way to move a little bit and get yourself up to red pressure, which that alone, that can be really useful if you're ready to get a good VMAX attack off, for instance. If you're in the green, however, it's also a move one and then you move your pressure down one, which then gets you to the lowest pressure level. Just remember about this card. This card is all about manipulation of where you are on the pressure level, which is very important to do with this class. Here we have our first X level card, Processing. I'm going to talk about the bottom first here because it's really uncomplicated and a card most classes have. <laughs> it's a move one, loot one. Pretty simple. The top sounds super interesting and it kind of is in some ways, but again, let's talk about it. So. When you play this card, the top card, it's going to go down into your active area after you play it. And at the start of the next round, you discard this card out of your active area in order to play three cards for that turn. You have to use one card as initiative still. You do still have to do at least one movement in that. But I think chances are high that you're probably going to do one move and two attacks when you use this action. And the other element to this card when you play it is just some pressure manipulation. If you're in the green, you get to move your pressure up one. If you're in the blue, you move your pressure up one and gain an experience. Now, this card sounds great. The idea of playing three cards in a turn is really potentially beneficial. But I'm always worried about my cards with this class. You only have nine cards. And after a couple rests, like it gets tighter and tighter. So the idea of playing three cards, although is nice, you're basically hurting your stamina by doing that. You're not going to be able to last as long throughout the scenario. But I will say that I've yet to exhaust from running out of cards with this class, so maybe I'm thinking about it a little bit too much. In any case, it feels like something that's situational again. I wouldn't want to use this repeatedly in a scenario because then you would really hurt your stamina. I might want to use it once. So a card that I'm going to use once for that effect, I, I just don't know if it's worth it for me. I could really see this as a cool thing to do as sort of a grand finale in a scenario. You save this card the whole time, and then you play it just to, you know, perform three actions and do two cool attacks. I can see that, but I just don't know if it's worth it. And the other thing that you have to keep in mind is that as you resolve those cards, like let's say you do play two attack cards. You play a move, and you play two attack cards. So you do your move, then you do one attack card, and if there's a pressure down on that attack card, which often there are, that will happen before you do that second attack, so that second attack is not going to be as good. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about this card. Again, it's not one that I've used, but as I've said before, I may be wrong. Our next card here is Recursion. This is an interesting one because the top and the bottom are basically mirror images of the other. It's also interesting because it's a 50 initiative right smack in the middle. So the top is an attack three, and then you play it into your active area. The next time you have a pressure up, you pressure up twice instead of just once. So that can be interesting. And the bottom is very similar. It's a move three. You play it into your active area. The next time you pressure down once, you pressure down twice instead. There's no additional experience here. There's no additional effects beyond that. It just lets you move your pressure meter a little bit faster. But... Like I've hinted at already, there's a mastery around your pressure levels that we'll get to at that part, and this card can definitely help in that particular mastery. Okay, our last level X card or level one available card to you is Curious Gear. And we're going to take a little bit of a side quest right now because I can't believe I didn't mention this already. A few of these cards, their card names represent items from Gloomhaven. If you played Gloomhaven and saw any of these items, you may have been familiar with some of the titles of these cards. Curious Gear is one of them. It was something that let you disarm traps in Gloomhaven when you found it. Other cards like Steam Armor, Power Core, Rocket Boots, and Ancient Drill, those are all items from Gloomhaven. I don't know if you already knew that, but it's kind of cool. So yeah, I think it's neat that they used this class and basically built them out of items from the previous game, which is kind of nifty. So what does this card do? The top action, you get to spring a trap within range three and apply its effects to an adjacent enemy. When you do spring that trap, you get to pressure up one level and you also gain an experience. So obviously this top action is kind of useless if there's not traps around. If you happen to be in a party with a particular class, this would be a very useful card to bring quite often. 
Um, I have used it a couple of times when I know that there's multiple traps in a scenario because it does feel like a good free way to get some damage out there and also get some free experience and a free pressure up. But, you know, again, it's a little dependent. It is also enticing because it's an initiative 12, which is the highest initiative that you have available to you at level 1. So, I don't know. If that really matters to you, maybe you bring this card anyways. The bottom is also kind of related to traps, but it can also be effective for hazardous terrain and other things. You get to control one enemy within range 4 and force them to move 1. And if you're at red pressure level and you do that action, you get to force them to move 2, but you, then you have to pressure down. So again, it's an interesting card, but very situational. So really think about the scenario you're going to be in if it makes sense. If you're with classes that generate things like hazardous terrain quite often, this could also be useful, this bottom action. Um, but I don't know if it trumps other cards that are available to you. But like I said, I have brought it a couple of times, and I did find it fun to do. It's always nice to spring a track on, trap on an unsuspecting enemy. So, now that all the level 1 cards are out of the way, what would you do for a level 1 build? Well, I'm not going to give you the full build. I've decided I don't like to do that. There's a lot of situational cards. People have different play styles. Maybe they like different things about cards that I don't like personally and that I don't bring. But what I will do instead is I'll talk about the 5 core cards that I will bring into my build for sure. My recommendation is to use these five cards as the core and then take the rest, the other four, based on what you like and what you think you'll enjoy. You think you'll like Curious Gear? Take that. You think you'll like some of the like more manipulative cards? Maybe you think that the cards that give you cards back are going to be really useful for the way you play? Then take those. So here are the core five that I would start with. Steam Armor I really like because it's really versatile. You can use it if you need to be tanky for a round, but you can also use it to prepare for attacks later. In most scenarios, I start with this card for, the, for its bottom action, because you start in green, I get to pressure up one in that very first round. Ancient Drill is just an excellent attack card, as is B-Max that is in here. Those two I bring for their attacks, and I always want those available for those attacks. Rocket Boots I really like for its movement capabilities and its push. An attack 3 with a push 2, don't underestimate how useful that can be in certain situations. At the very least, if you're attacking a enemy with a high retaliate, you can push them away before they're able to retaliate on you, which is always nice. And then lastly, Power Core. Not as much for the top, because it is a burn. I do use this, but only in certain situations, this top action. But that bottom action is useful kind of all the time. You will take damage with this class, because you're all melee. So if you have some heals available that you can give to yourself, that's great. I would also add that the bottom of Power Core I've actually enhanced to make that a base heal 4, which makes it even better. So there you have it. That's what I'd think about at level 1. As far as builds in general, I think that you can see that this class can be a tank or can be tanky DPS. And we're really going to get into that as we get into our level 2 and level 3 card choices and what we want to do. In many cases, there's one card that's going to more benefit you more if you're playing a tanky style, and another card that's going to benefit you more if you're going for damage. One last important note about builds, and I can't believe I haven't noted this already, but as I mentioned, you unlock this class fairly late in the campaign. So if you're not already at a high enough prosperity level that you don't have to start at level 1 anyways, I don't know how you unlock this class, to be totally honest. So chances are very high you're going to start this at level 2 or maybe level 3, I don't know, maybe even level 4. So that's going to change how you build the character entirely, of course. So, let's get to those level up cards. On the left we have Release Valve. The top action, all adjacent enemies suffer 2 damage, and also brings your pressure level down 1. If you're in the red pressure level, it deals an additional damage, so 3 damage to all adjacent enemies, and your pressure down level will go down 2 in that case. One for the red pressure level 1, and the other for just the pure top action of the card. If you're in the yellow, it will still only do 2 damage, but will still pressure you down 2. So yellow seems maybe a weird time to use this, I don't know. But it can be beneficial to be in the blue, so maybe this will help in that case. 30 initiative is okay, can be useful in some situations. The bottom at its base is a move 3. And if you're in the red, you get to move 3 and then heal yourself for 3, gain an experience, and pressure down 1. So that's release valve on the left. On the right, we have bronze plating. The top action of bronze plating is a shield 1 for the entire scenario, technically, if you leave it out. The important thing to note, though, is that while this is out, you cannot perform move abilities. 
Now, if you're in the blue or in the green pressure, you also get to give yourself regenerate, you get an experience, and you bring your pressure up by one. This card does have a nice initiative at 18. You don't have any really high initiatives as of yet with this class, unless you count the Curious Gear, which is all situational. But 18 is a pretty good initiative for you. The bottom action, though, is why I took this card over the other one. Add plus one to all your melee attacks this round. All of your attacks this round, not just one. It also brings your pressure up one. Now you can't move with this card when you do that, so you have to be in position already, but it's a great way to get you one more pressure and also add bonus damage to your attacks. I took bronze plating primarily to use it for that bottom, which is very useful, but I do actually use the top with it sometimes as well. It can be a good thing to use in a pinch and also can help if you're a little low on health, but maybe we'll have a little bit more time where you can use the regenerate. What you can do is you play this card out, while you're at blue or green pressure, it will give you the regenerate. You can then dismiss the card the next round so you can start moving and you will still have the regenerate as long as you haven't taken damage. So keep that in mind. Release Valve I see is more the pure tanky card in this scenario. Even though, even though the other one has the shield one, this card allows you to, to deal damage to all adjacent enemies. And if you're playing tanky, there's a good chance that you're surrounded by enemies a lot of the time. And this could come in useful in those cases. And the bottom is nice for a tank as well, since it has a move and a heal in some situations. Here's what we have at level 3. We have Stress Fence, and we have Electrical Discharge. The left one, Stress Fence. Stress Fence is a card you will put into your active area, which will stay out unless you dismiss it, or you get down to blue level pressure. When an enemy within range 2 attacks you, you can basically spend a pressure and move your pressure down in order to cause that enemy to suffer 3 damage after the attack. This card also does give you one pressure up when you play it out. So if you can manipulate your pressure while you have this card out, you potentially could leave it out there a long time. You just have to make sure you don't get out into the blue. Think about it this way. It's a range 2 retaliate that actually does 3 damage instead of 2 or 1, and it could potentially be left out a long time if you manipulate your pressure correctly. It also has a very good initiative at 15, and the bottom action is interesting for a tank as well. It's a move to retaliate one. That's okay. A lot of classes have something like that, but it gets a lot better if you're at the right pressure level. If you're at yellow pressure, you get to add another retaliate to that. So it's a move to retaliate two, and you have to move your pressure now. If you're in the red, this turns into a move to retaliate three. You gain an experience, you take a damage, and you have to move your pressure now. Again, both halves of this card I think are really good for a tanky type build. On the other side, with electrical discharge, now, it doesn't look too fancy, but basically what this is, is this is a repeatable stun. It's a stun that is not a burn card, so you can use it quite often. The top half at its base is an attack 2 with stun. If you're in the yellow, you get to do an attack 3 with stun and bring your pressure down 1. If you're in the red, it's an attack 5 with stun. You gain an experience, you have to take 2 damage, and you move your pressure down 1. But again, it's a non-loss stun card. And when you're in the red, that's a 5 damage stun card. It also has a decent initiative at 26, which can be useful. And the bottom is another way to perform stuns, although this one is a little more dicey, and I don't think I've used it very often. So it's a move 4, and then you get to stun at range 1. It's not stun all, it's just stun at range 1, so you'll have to choose the target. The problem with this action is if you're in the green, the yellow, or the red, you will also have to stun yourself. So the only time I've used this card is if I'm at blue pressure. Then I can get a free stun off with a move 4, and it's great. But that just doesn't happen very often. The way that I've been playing this class so far is I, often, I more regularly want to stay up in the yellow and the red because I'm doing a lot of attack actions with, which benefit from those pressure levels. So I'm not often all the way down at blue to take advantage of the bottom of this card. And doing this move 4 no matter what also does lower your pressure. So I did take Electrical Discharge. I like the free stun that I can use in any situation as a sort of get out of jail free card. But I honestly don't love it as a level 3 card. But the other one didn't make much sense for me when I'm playing more of a DPS build either. I guess I theoretically could have taken the other one and take advantage of that top action of Stress Vents. But I don't know. Um, I don't think either one was great for the damage build. But I just... For me, ultimately, the free stun won out. Okay, so I was a little underwhelmed by the level 3 cards, I have to admit. I really do like the choices at level 4. I know, right away you're going to say, oh, that's an attack 9. I gotta take the attack 9. Well, it is an attack 9 at base, but it's also a burn. 
I mean, you get two experience for it, but it's a burn, so you get to use it that one time. And it is cool to get off an attack nine, but, you know, you only have nine cards, so when are you going to use that actual attack nine? And besides, this card really isn't necessarily about that. It's about doing a big attack and also manipulating your pressure level. Basically, you can spend damage off that attack to increase or de decrease your pressure level. For each one, you have to reduce it by one. So if you do, instead of doing attack nine, you can do an attack six and move your pressure up three or move your pressure down three. Or you can do an attack seven, move it up two or down two. You know, you get it. The bottom is a base move one, but if you have fire available, you can burn that fire and turn it into a move three with an experience. And also, whenever you get attacked that round, your pressure will rise up one. Let's look at Magnetic Field. I like this card a lot. I like the theming of it. It all seems to make sense. The top, at its base, is an attack three, and then you get to do a loot one. It's nice that you get to do an attack first, because if there's a couple loots there, and then you can kill another enemy and like generate another loot, then you get to get all of them. Very nice mixture. If ice is available, you can burn that ice to also heal yourself for two. And if you're in the blue, you also get an additional heal, a heal three. You gain an experience and you move your pressure up one. Keep in mind those two heals are separate. So if you're poisoned and you have ice and are at the blue, this can be really useful because you use the two heal first, which will remove your poison. And then the three heal will actually go towards your hit points. Now the bottom part of this it didn't really make a lot of sense to me at first, but once I used it in practice, I could see its usability. This bottom action you can use with the top of Vmax in order to move enemies into the right position to maximize that card. So you do a pull one targeting all range five. You just get to move them one. Then you get to do another pull one targeting all enemies at range two. And again, like pulling, you don't have to pull all the enemies. It's not like you have to move every one. You can pick and choose which ones you're going to move, and where you're going to move them, as long as they move closer to you. And to wrap this card up, if you're in the red pressure level, you also get a shield out of it, which can be nice since you're potentially pulling three enemies right next to you for a big VMAX attack. Okay, at level 5, you have Radiation on the left and Heat Conduction on the right. Radiation at its base is an attack 5 with Poison. Note you also have a Diamond Enhancement slot here, so you could add an additional negative condition to this. Well, it is a level 5 card, so it will be costly to do that. If you're at the yellow, you must remove, reduce the attack by 1, but you get to raise your pressure up 1. So it's an attack 4 with poison, but it will get you from yellow to red. If you're in the green, you also reduce it by 1, but then you move your pressure down. So this is a good attack to use if you want to get to your maximum pressure or to your minimum pressure. If you want to get to the red or get to the blue, depending on where you are. It's also just a straight up good basic attack. Attack 5 or an attack 4 with poison. It's not fantastic for a level 5 card, but it's pretty good. It's a 37 initiative, so it's in that region where it kind of doesn't matter a whole lot. You will get to go before some of the monsters with this many times, but not before the fast ones. The bottom at its base is a move 3, and it goes out into your active area. And the next time you have to suffer damage from one of your abilities, if there's an enemy adjacent to you, you can cause that enemy to suffer the damage instead. Now, Heat Conduction. At its base, the top action is a shield 1, generate ice. It is 11 initiative, we should note that. That's a very, very good initiative. I think that's the highest initiative you have available to you at this point. But that's what it is at its base, a shield and ice. If you're in the red when you, when you put out this card, you also get to add retaliate 3 to it, in addition to an experience, and move your pressure down one level. Now, if you're on the other side of the spectrum and you're in the blue, you get to add two shields for a total of three shields with this top action. You get to generate experience and move your pressure up one. So this card seems like an obvious tanky card. It's dealing with shields, it's dealing with retaliate, but I wouldn't rule out using it on a damage build too, just as an occasional way to survive being in the midst of a bunch of enemies, for instance. The bottom of this card is actually a scenario level effect. So you put it out, it will stay out for the entire scenario unless you dismiss it. When you have this card out, whenever an ally moves adjacent to you, you can move your pressure up one in order to perform a heal two on yourself. You basically keep it out unless you get to the red pressure level and then you have to discard it, which is similar to one of the other cards that we have that we looked at earlier at level one. This bottom action by default also does cause your pressure to move down one. For me, I pretty easily went with radiation just because of that attack five with poison. That also allows me to manipulate my pressure. 
And I have used the bottom action once or twice, but I haven't seen a, a huge benefit out of it. If I were a tank, I would definitely go with the other card. Here we are at level 6. I think we have an obvious damage card and an obvious tank card in this case. Scalding Blast on the left is what I took. It's an obvious damage card. It's a base attack 5 and gets even better depending on your pressure levels. If you're a green pressure level, you get to make an attack 6, which that alone is pretty good in attack 6. If you're at yellow pressure, it's an attack 5 still, but you get to add a target. So you're targeting two enemies with an attack 5. You gain an experience, you have to take a damage, and you have to move your pressure down 1. If you're all the way in the red, you get to add two targets. So it's an attack 5 on three different targets. And again, they just have to be next to you for this because it's melee. Attack 5 on three targets, you gain an experience, you have to take two damage, you have to move your pressure down 2. So there's definitely a price for that, but it's not too bad considering what you get out of it. Three attack fives. It's a 45 initiative, so useless in that respect. The bottom, though, is another bottom attack, which is also nice to have if you're running the damage version of this class. Attack three, pierce two. Sure, it's not a huge attack, but it's a bottom attack, and it has pierce, which is a bonus. And in addition to all that, it also raises your pressure up one and generates fire. Okay, on to Steam Core, which I am suggesting is definitely the tanky card in this case. At its core, this is a heal 5 self, and you generate fire or ice when you perform this top action. Now, if you're in the red when you perform this action, you also get to wound all within range 1. You also get an experience, and you move your pressure down 1 when you perform that action. Conversely, if you're down at the blue pressure level and you perform this heal, you also give regenerate to all your allies within range 1. That does not include you in that case. You also gain an experience and you move your pressure up one. So a pretty good top for healing and doing some other stuff at the same time. It's a 71 initiative, so at least it's a little bit later, which could be useful for, some, for something like this. If you're going to put out a heal, it can sometimes be beneficial to do that a little bit later after maybe you've taken some damage. And the bottom action is a move three at base, and it's similar to another card we looked at at level one, where it goes out into your active area, and then you can basically spend that card and pressure up in order to add two to a movement and an experience to that movement. So you could theoretically take one of the move fours you have and turn it into a move six by spending this card in a later round. That's pretty good. But again, for me, it was obvious to take the left card in this case, and I would recommend the same thing if you're going for the damage build. And at level seven, we'll start with Heated Drill on the left, which again, I think the left card is the damage dealing card and the one that I would take. I've not yet reached level seven, so everything from here on out is just me looking at the cards and making an evaluation. Heated Drill is an attack 4, but if you can consume fire, it turns it into an attack 6 and gives you an experience. This is one of the first cards with a elemental consumption that I think might be worth you using it over maybe other classes, depending on what they're doing with it. An attack 6 is pretty good with that experience. And then if you're at different pressure levels, it gives you additional bonuses. So if you're at the yellow pressure, you get to add Pierce 2 and an experience to that attack. So if you can consume the fire, that's an attack 6, pierce 2 with an experience. If you're at the red level, you similarly add pierce, but now you add pierce 4 to it. So it could be an attack 6 with pierce 4. And in addition to that, you also get to dish out wound with that attack. You also gain an experience, you also have to take a damage, and you also have to move your pressure level down 1. This card is also an AD initiative, so at least again, it's a later initiative that could be useful because it's later in the round if you need to go later. If you want to wait for enemies to get into the right position to dish out this attack, it could make sense. The bottom one is another one that's similar to another card we saw way back at level 1, where it was a move 3 and then you get to add plus 1 move for each pair of cards in your discard pile. This is different where instead it's, instead of a move 3, it's an attack 3 and you get to add 1 pierce for each, for each pair of cards in your discard pile. It also has pierce 1 as base. So you theoretically could make this an attack 3 pierce 4. But again, like that other card that we talked about before, you only have 9 cards. How often are you going to maximize this card? Not very often. So at red pressure, this turns into a move and attack. And one interesting note about that is if you're able to do this move and attack at red pressure, there's nothing that moves your pressure down. So you could do a move and attack and then do a maximum damage top attack after that. So for me, when I get to level 7, I'm definitely taking heated drill. Now, for the tanks out there, we have Cryogenic Hibernation. This, again, is one that's similar to an earlier card, to a level 1 card. It's like a better version of it. That one gave you one shield. This one gives you two shields. 
And this is similar to that other one, but that one you couldn't perform move abilities. In this case, you can't attack after you put this out. You have two shields, but you can't attack for the rest of the scenario. The next important note here is that at the end of each of your turns, you gain Brittle. So if you have Brittle, that's going to make that shield a lot less useful, right? And it's important to note that it's at the end of your turns. So it's not like you could just heal the Brittle away with a regenerator or something like that. You have to actively try to get that Brittle healed or just suffer the consequences of it. If you're at blue pressure level and you put this card out, you get to perform a heal for self. You gain an experience and you move your pressure up one. Now, there is nothing on this card that makes you dismiss it, so you theoretically could put this out for the entire scenario. Just realize you're never going to attack in that scenario if you do. But maybe that's fun. Maybe that's interesting. And there's a mastery that will tell you that, hey, that will be interesting. Again, we'll get to that later. The other thing about this top action, and this is the same for a lot of the scenario level effects for this particular class, you can dismiss them and they're not losses. So you can get them back even though you dismiss them. Keep that in mind. So you could put out that two shield just for a round or two and then dismiss it because you want to start attacking again or something like that. And you can later get the card back. And that 19 initiative is pretty nice. Not fantastic, but pretty nice for you at this point. And the bottom action here is a base move two. If you're in the yellow, you get one more move, so it's a move three. If you're in the green, you get two more move, so it's a move four. And you move your pressure up one. And if you're all the way down at blue pressure level and ice is available, you can put this card out for a move two. And if you consume the ice, you can put brittle on one enemy within range one after that move. You also gain an experience and move your pressure up. So if you're in the blue, you always get the experience and pressure up. But obviously you have to burn the ice for the brittle effect here. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting closer to level nine cards and I can't wait to get there. You'll see in a minute. But here's your level eight cards. Piston Barrage and Curious Machinery. And as is the case often, as you get higher and higher in levels, cards get more and more interesting, and I think that's definitely the case here. Piston Barrage at base is just an attack four, but obviously that changes at different pressure levels. If you're at yellow pressure level, it's an attack four, and then also an attack three after that. Remember that attack occurs after that one. These are separate attacks. It's not like it's an attack seven. It's an attack four, then an attack three. You gain an experience and move your pressure down one. If you're all the way in the red, you have an attack four, and then you have an attack three, and then you have another attack three, all in one round. Feels kind of blink bladeish, doesn't it? You also gain an experience, you also have to take a damage, and you also have to move your pressure down one when you perform that top action in the red. It's a 33 initiative, which is, again, one of those middling kind of okay ones. Better than the 40s, but worse than the teens and the 20s. And your bottom action here is a base move three, and then all adjacent enemies suffer two damage. This doesn't require any pressure or any elements or anything, just a move three, and all adjacent suffer two damage. This movement also destroys all adjacent obstacles, which in some scenarios, there are some pesky obstacle things you have to deal with, and this could be very helpful in those cases. And it also moves your pressure up one. So I like this one. I like the theming of it, Piston Barrage. It makes sense. You're either doing a Piston Barrage on an enemy, or you're doing a piston barrage on obstacles and just like going nuts on them. I like this card. I probably will take this one when I get to level eight. But the other one, Curious Machinery, also looks pretty fun. With this one, you get to control an enemy within range three. Have that enemy perform an attack three with stun. So you can have that enemy stun one of his buddies for you. Now, if you're also at the red pressure level, when you do that, you also stun the enemy that you controlled. So you stun two enemies for the top action of this card if you're in the red. You also gain an experience. You also must take two damage. And you also must move your pressure down two levels when you do that. But hey, all that and this is not a loss. So that can be very, very useful. Two stuns when you're at red pressure level and it's not a loss. That can be pretty good. It's also an 11 initiative. A really good one for us. Again, I don't think we've seen any that are sub 10 at this point. Actually, I'm sure we haven't. But 11 is right up there with your top initiatives. I think, it, I think you have another card that's at 11 already. The bottom action is also interesting. This is about traps. So in this case, it's a move four. And if you trigger a damage trap while you're using this bottom action, it changes it from a damage trap into a heal trap. It's basically the same value of the damage. So if there was like a damage five or six trap that you walk through, that turns it into a five or six heal for you, which is... That can be really nice in the right situation. But again, it's situational for that to be useful. You can also use this card to manipulate your steam two levels. 
If you're in the yellow and you can burn ice, you can move it down two levels. If you're in the green and you can burn fire, you can move it up two levels. In both cases, you get one experience out of that action. Like I said, I'm pretty sure I'm taking Piston Barrage, but I can see the benefits of that stun one, and I think that stun one is fun. So I don't know. That could drive me in a different direction. We'll see when I get there. Okay, here we go. Level 9 cards. Level 9 cards are always fun. There's always crazy stuff happening, and that is definitely the case here. I think... We're going to get to it in a minute, but I think my favorite level 9 card is one of these cards on the screen right here that I've seen thus far in the game. So, first, let's talk about the one on the left, because I'm talking about the one on the right. We'll get there. Polarity Shift. With Polarity Shift, you get to do a pull 3, targeting all enemies within range 4. This is kind of similar to the Magnetic Field one from earlier. It's a way to pull everything towards you. It's a bigger pull. Instead of just the pull 1 there, it's a pull 3. So you can pull them right up next to you. And that makes sense, because the next two things that can happen depend on you burning elements and doing interesting new things. So if fire is available, you can burn that, and all adjacent enemies suffer one damage. So you could theoretically pull three, four enemies right next to you, and then make them all suffer one damage. When you do that, you also generate ice at the end of the round. Conversely, if you have ice available, you can burn the ice and basically do the opposite, do the same thing. You burn the ice, they all suffer one damage, and then you generate fire at the end of the round. So you just need fire or ice to make that effect work. And after all that happens, you then get to push three. So you brought all these enemies in, caused them some damage, and then threw them back out. Push three, targeting all range two. So it even includes enemies that aren't right next to you. You get to throw everybody away from you. It's, you know, it seems like a fun card. It should be a fun card. It's level nine. As much fun as it is, I won't take it. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. The 79 initiative, again, it's good that we're getting a later initiative. It's not one of those 40s or 50s or something like that. So it can be useful in that respect. And then the bottom action is a whole mess, depending on what pressure level you're at. If you're at red pressure, this bottom action is an attack 5, and you move your pressure down 3 levels. If you're at yellow pressure, it's a move 5, and you move your pressure down 2 levels. If you're at green pressure, it's a shield 2, and you move your pressure up 2 levels. You're all the way down at blue pressure. It's a heal six, and you move your pressure up three levels. So, whichever one of these actions you take, it's going to take you from one end of the spectrum. It's going to take you to the maximum in that one. So, if you're in the green when you do this, you're ultimately going to be in the red. If you're in the yellow, you're ultimately going to be in the blue. It's polarity shift, you know? Things are happening. So, there we go. That's an interesting card. I definitely like it. But, I'll never play it because I'm taking the other one. So, let's talk about unstable core. And this one is really, really cool, and I'm basically referring to the top action. We'll get to the bottom action, but let's talk about the top first. So, for this top action, you play this card, and you get to play four cards from your lost pile. That's right, you get to pick up four cards from your lost pile, and play all of them. I'd also like to note about this, it doesn't say that you have to play any bottoms, or any tops. It just says you can play all four of them. You can play the top or the bottom. If you want to play four top actions, you can do that. If you want to play four bottom actions, you can do that. Two and two, whatever. You're going to play four cards after you play this. Also, and this is really key for this card, for those cards, you get to activate any level of the pressure that you want. If you prefer the yellow pressure effect, then you can activate that one for that card. If you want the red pressure for every one, you can activate that for every one. Sounds like fun, right? Now, the problem is you become exhausted after this. But if there's a way to go out, this is the way to go out in Frosthaven. Go into a room. Maybe there's a few guys left. Maybe you're just going to blow it all on a boss. In any case, you're going to play four cards, four cards that are in your lost pile, and maximize the value of all those cards in one round, and then become exhausted afterwards. I mean, there's no better way to go. I love it, and I can't wait to try it out. The bottom action. Yeah, we got to talk about it. Because you're not going to use that top action until towards the end of any given scenario, right? I mean, you're going to want to wait until you have good cards in your lost pile, first of all. And it's probably like a, hey, I'm going to exhaust anyways, so I'm just going to use this action and blow up a room. One other note before we get to the bottom action is the 10 initiative, which is helpful. Um, I think the problem with this card is it doesn't really have like a, I guess you could use the bottom, you could use base move and base attack on it while you're waiting to do that top action. So that maybe makes it a little bit sketchy. But still, that top action is so good, I'm not going to care. So, for the bottom. The bottom is a scenario level effect. You put it out in your active area and it's going to stay there. Unless you end up in red pressure or 
blue pressure at the end of a turn. So what does it do? When you put this out, when you perform an attack, you can choose to pressure down to add three damage to that attack. Or if you perform a move, you can pressure up to add three move to that movement. So you can juice up an attack or a move while this is out. But again, like I said, when you have blue pressure or red pressure, you're going to have to discard this. So if that pressure move makes you move up into the red or the blue, you're going to discard this card. And you're also going to have to have to take five damage when you do that. Five damage. But at this level, you also have 26 hit points. So maybe five damage doesn't seem so bad. And again, like other cards in it, of its like, it doesn't go into your loss pile. This is not a loss. This is just a discard when that happens. But to reiterate, I don't care about the bottom. I don't care about anything else on this card. I just want to play four cards from my loss pile and go nuts on one turn. It's, it's going to be fun. I'll do it at least one time. All right, let's talk about our masteries. We've hinted at these quite a few times because there are many cards that are available to you that will help you do each of these masteries. The first one, never attack. That's right, never attack for a whole scenario. This is definitely one that you have to plan to do. You better tell your party that you're planning to do it and how you intend to do it. Now, there are a lot of things that you can do with just like causing enemies to suffer damage with this class, which maybe make it make more sense. And you also would have to bring a very specific collection of cards with you, I believe, to make this useful or something that you want to actually try. So just keep that in mind. It's doable. You're going to be very tanky. You're going to be doing a lot of shield stuff. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of causing enemies to suffer damage. But you can't attack the whole time if you want to get this mastery. It might be one that you, if you know a scenario looks like it's maybe kind of short or maybe kind of easy for one reason or another, maybe that's a good time to try to break this one out. I'd also recommend waiting until you have higher level cards to try to do this, just so you can have some of those other ones that deal damage in different ways, right? Your other mastery. For this one, for four consecutive rounds, you have to either move from the very bottom, blue pressure, all the way to the top, red pressure, or the other way around. You basically have to ping pong between blue and red pressure for four consecutive rounds. So if you're going after this one, you're going to start in blue or start in red, and then you're going to go blue, and then red, and then blue, and then red. And it can be done, but this is another one. Again, I think both the masteries for this class require you to be at a higher level to really effectively go after them. I can tell you that I'm now at level 6, and I have not yet attempted either of these, but I'm getting to the point where I'm thinking about it, so we'll see. Now let's talk about perks. Like we discussed before, if you're playing the drill, you are probably starting at higher prosperity level. You've probably retired one, maybe multiple characters, and you'll probably start with a whole handful of perks at the very beginning. I believe I started with five the first time when I first played this class. Um, so I expect you'll do the same. Maybe five, maybe six perks at the very beginning when you first create your character. So you have a lot of choices to make. The first thing I'll definitely suggest is take the one that removes the minus one effects from items. Because you're going to want to have tanky items with this class. Since you're melee, you're going to be up close and personal. Even if you're not playing the tank build, you're going to want to have shields and stuff like that that often add these minus one cards. And additionally, it also adds two plus one cards, so it has an extra bonus on top of it. So I'd definitely take that one. In addition to that, I would take that first perk, all three checks in it. It removes a minus one and replaces it with a plus zero. When you draw that card, you also get to raise or lower your pressure after that attack. That's very useful with this class. Also, that raising or lowering of pressure is optional, so don't feel like you have to do it. If you're already at the red... You can just ignore it and just take the plus zero. It's better than the minus one it would have been originally. I want to have all three of these in my deck to make sure that I'm able to manipulate the pressure in the way I want to do it. Okay, for my next perks, I could go a couple different ways with this. I often say that I want to make sure I take all the ones that remove minus ones. So I think if you're playing damage, you definitely want to do that. So we've spent four perks already. And let's say you started with five. Then you can take one of these next ones where you replace a minus one card with a rolling shield card. Try to do that one and the other one, but you also theoretically instead could take the perk where when you long rest you get to move your pressure up down, up one or down one. Again, pressure manipulation is everything. The other thing I would note is that since I'm a nine card class, I'm almost always long resting unless I absolutely need to be in that next round. I'm planning things out very specifically, letting my team know that hey, next round I'm going to long rest after it because I only have two cards left, right? I want to make sure that I'm long resting as much as possible. That's to get my items back because I'm using those shields and armor quite a bit. 
and also to make sure that I can manipulate my Steam by taking this perk. And lastly, just so I can make sure that I pick which cards I'm going to lose. I only have nine cards, and really there are two key damage cards for me right now. The Ancient Drill card and the Beam Axe card. I would hate to lose either one of those, and I do not like the idea of randomly potentially losing one. I could draw one of them, then suffer the damage, and then draw the other one and still lose one of my top attack cards. I do not want that to happen. I long rest almost every time with this class. At that point, I think it kind of becomes up to you and what you want to do, what, you're, what kind of experience you're having with the class. I do like the other special perk here about poison, where if you take that perk and you suffer poison, you can instead suffer damage to ignore the poison. Now that can be costly if you're dealing with a lot of imps that are doing poison all the time, which happens quite a bit, but it can be really effective in other situations. Yes, you're taking an extra damage, but you're avoiding potentially one, two, three, four damage down the line from that poison. Especially because you only have that one heal card and you don't necessarily want to be using your actions for that very often when you're a damage dealer or whatnot. So I definitely like that one. It's nice to never worry about poison, although you do have to take a damage to do it. But going back to our hit points again, we have tank hit points. So we have hit points to spare. I'd rather spend one than the four that a poison might do. I also can't help but be drawn into the add one plus three damage card, <laughs> plus three modifier card. Uh, I'm playing damage with this. I want to pull that one, especially on a B-Max or something like that, and have a huge hit. So I definitely take that plus three. And I'm also considering the add plus one that also have heals. I like that they're heals, but they're also plus ones with that rolling heal. I'm also interested in the one where you add one plus one card that also includes a heal. I think that's nice. You could use heals with this class. Again, you're taking a lot of damage. You're absorbing a lot of damage. Even if you're playing damage dealer or tank, you're absorbing a lot of damage. So that's helpful. And of course, the other one that has rolling heals in it. I mean, all these perks are pretty good, but I feel like I have to talk about the very bottom one. I haven't yet taken this. Um, and even though I talked about how much I love that level nine card, where this is sort of a version of that in a way, I don't know if I'm just confused by it or what, but let me read the thing and what it says it does. So it's three checks to get this, first of all. And one each, once each scenario, when you would become exhausted, instead of becoming ex exhausted, you stun yourself and cause yourself to go invisible. You lose all your cards. I'm reading that as meaning you lose literally all your cards that you have going to your lost pile. You then recover cards from the, four cards from that lost pile. So then you have four cards, but then you discard all those cards. So the next turn, you're going to have to probably long rest, which kind of makes sense because you're going to be stunned that next turn. Then you perform a long rest that next turn to get three cards back and do a heal and maybe get back up into, you know, into fighting shape or whatnot. I don't know. It seems like a lot. Uh, and honestly, I feel like the times that I've actually become exhausted, like we were going to lose that scenario anyways. I don't know if it's worked the same for you, but I don't often feel like, oh, I'm getting exhausted in the middle of a scenario for some weird reason. Like usually it's because we're getting trounced for one reason or another. We made some sort of strategic mistake or something like that. So the usefulness of this just doesn't seem to be there for me. But again, this is another area. I could be wrong. So tell me in the comments if you think I'm crazy and this is the first perk you're, perk you're taking. I can understand. I'd love to hear the argument for it. It sounds really interesting, but I just don't think it's something I'm going to use. And again, to wrap up perks, like I've always said about perks, I try to say this in all my videos, take what you like. It's a game. Don't try to min-max everything here, you know? Yes, there are some that I think are better than others, but that doesn't mean they don't all have some sort of application depending on how you want to play the class. Take what appeals to you. Take what makes sense to you. Have fun with it. Lastly here, let's talk about items with this class. I think this is another example. If you're playing the drill, you're an experienced Frost Haven player. You're not somebody who's new to the game, who needs to understand what items are good and what items are bad. So I don't know that I can provide a whole lot of information for you that's going to like change your world or anything. It also depends a lot on what items your party has unlocked to this point, what you have available to you. And chances are that you have a lot of cool stuff that you've unlocked. I don't want to get into unlocked items because different people unlock different items at different times. Even though we're probably all experienced players here, who knows what you have unlocked versus what I have unlocked. But I think you know some basics. 
I think you realize that your melee, so things that give you some shields while you're up close and personal, are useful. Things that increase your attack power are very useful, obviously, when you're doing if you're doing the damage build. Um, the other thing that I would definitely add is recovery is important. So stamina potions are definitely good for you. I took a stamina potion at the very beginning. I still have a stamina potion. I'm actually considering getting another one um, because it's useful to have ways to recover your cards that aren't going to actually harm you, like some of the ways that you can do it with the cards themselves. Um, so obviously things like power potions are also good if you're going with the damage build. You know, I, I think you know. <laughs> you know what's good in items if you're playing this class. Like, you're not going to rip this class open never having played the game before and have no idea what, you know, a power potion is or have no idea what a healing potion is. You'll, you'll be fine. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say about items. So, there you have it. That's my guide to the drill. That's how I feel about it. As usual, I usually say the same thing at the, at the end of these videos. I'm having a lot of fun with this class. But that's a good thing. I would hate to be doing this video if I came in here and told you, you know what? I really don't like this class. Isaac and team really messed this one up. Thankfully, that has not been the case. I've enjoyed every class I've played thus far. Um, I really like that they are so different, right? To this point, I've played Banner Spear. I've played Meteor. I've played Bone Shaper. And now I'm playing the Drill. And each one of those is completely different. There's no shared space between them, right? There are very different things they do, different mechanics, different builds, different ways they play the game. I really appreciate that. I love that about Frosthaven. So there you have it. That's the end of it. Thanks for watching again. Please like, subscribe, do all that stuff if you want to. If not, look for more videos from me in the future. I definitely plan on doing a video about things that I don't like about Frosthaven. Because now we're really close to the end in my particular group. And I'm starting to see the things where I like, I felt like I liked it at first, but maybe now not so much. So look for a video like that in the future. Also look for some board game reviews in my future. I have to branch out a little bit. This is not just a Frost Haven channel. This will be other things as well. So I get in, into reviews of other games. Although that first one might actually be buttons and bugs. Anyhow, look for that stuff in the future. Again, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you soon.